Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burek of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first-time guest, but I just started following his work. I actually listened to an excellent interview over at Macro Voices, hearing him talk about the commodities, the entire commodities complex, especially energy. He is a managing partner at a natural resource fund for over a decade. He also worked in investment banking. He's a chartered financial analyst and a managing partner at his natural resource fund, Adam Rosenswag. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Excited to talk today. I want to start talking about oil and the energy markets because I think that's the most interesting right now. And we're recording this interview on Thursday, June 1st, 2023. The West Texas intermediate price is a little over $70 a barrel. Natural gas is down substantially again after a short rally a couple weeks ago, back to a little above $2.10. I want to get your thoughts, though, on the oil price. Do you, in your opinion, every five to ten dollars a barrel lower, will that cause supply problems in the oil market? Um, look, I think the answer is uh, yes. I think that <clears throat> the oil markets today are being driven completely by investor fear, and that investor fear is almost entirely tied up on the demand side of the equation. So, most investors that I speak to, or clients that I speak to, are really worried about a recession. And what that's going to do to oil demand. And and that seems to be the main driving force behind selling crude off. Um, A few things to note that I think are kind of interesting about that. The first is, most importantly, we're not really seeing any weakness in any of the data that we look at. So we had a little bit of weakness over the winter in December and January, but that was mostly weather related. And since then, we're actually seeing quite robust demand, even out of China, where everyone's talking about how there's this sort of impending doom there. There very well might be, but we haven't seen it yet in any of our data that we look at. But most importantly, this this cycle is ultimately going to be driven by supply. So I think all of this concern about demand is a little bit misplaced. And the reason I think this cycle in oil and energy is going to be driven by supply is because we're coming out of one of the most classic capital cycles that I can recall in my career and probably the most severe. Uh, So looking all the way back to you know, 2005 to 2010, way back in that period, there was a huge feeling that we were running out of oil. Hubbard's Peak was being talked about with uh, quite a re- lot of regularity. And <clears throat> as a result of that, oil prices spiked and a huge amount of money flowed into the resources space and most notably in the oil and gas space. And, you know, you could go to investment conferences and cocktail parties and people talked about all the oil stocks that they owned. And when's the last time that happened recently? Um, Prices fell in 2014, and they've been sort of volatile ever since, and money just poured out of the space. So if you look back now over the last 10 or 15 years, we've cut spending in the resources world, and most notably in the oil world, by like 65%, and we've underspent by about a trillion dollars. So that's the main driving force behind the oil market as far as I see it going forward. Um, The resources world and the energy world is a cyclical one by nature. And it's cyclical because of these capital cycles with money flowing in, sanctioning new projects, too much supply comes online, prices fall and everything pours back out again. And we're we're coming up to the end of a very classic, very, very bullish setup for crude because of the huge amount of underinvestment. And it's as simple as that. So people are worried about demand, but I think ultimately this is going to be a supply story for the next several years until we get that money spent again. Yeah, I remember when I was a for my day job as an investment analyst, and I was an oil analyst working with Robert Rapier and some of the other people at an oil newsletter, and they were talking about the underinvestment in capex. This was back in 2013. Really, a lot of the capex was invested mostly into shale, into the shale plays, and a lot of the other industry was underinvesting. There was over a trillion dollars estimates back then of underinvestment in capital. It's probably even worse now. But to add to your point there about the fundamentals for the oil market, just in the last couple of weeks, there's been articles coming out for headlines on oilprice.com with extensive articles that uh, global oil demand hit hit a record in the last couple of weeks. And then we have the rig count falling he- a lot here in the US and global oil inventories are also down. So from a fundamental standpoint, that looks good. But from a global macro standpoint, the global macro hedge fund managers that are all short-term oriented appear to just want to short oil and everything energy. I know I think that's exactly right and I think that um <clears throat> over the next, you know, several months and then ultimately over the next several years people who try to understand the fundamentals will really be vindicated here and and the reason I think that is 
Um, like you said, inventories are at a very low level right now. You know, you're anywhere between two and 300 million barrels below the five-year averages in crude and products. And um, it's leaving us very, very little buffer uh, against any type of a supply disruption of which there's plenty possible on the horizon. Um, and, and you're right, you know, if you go back to the 2013-14 period, a lot of money was going into shale, <clears throat> but no money was going into conventional oil. And sure enough, people don't really talk about it, but conventional oil has been declining uh, pretty much ever since. You know, I think it peaked in 2011, 2012. And if you strip the shales out of the global oil base, uh, the non-OPEC world has been in pretty su sustained decline ever since. So, you know, I think that's a really, really good predictor of future production is ultimately how much money you spend. But, you know, today the oil markets are also trading on something that I think is very, very bizarre and we'll look back on as, as quite short-sighted. Lots of people, and ourselves included, <clears throat> we look to the inventory level to tell us whether supply and demand is balanced. So basically, when supply is running ahead of demand, you have too much oil, inventories grow, and vice versa, when demand is too high relative to supply and you're in deficit, you know, inventories fall. So by studying the near-term inventory trends, you can get a pretty good sense as to whether the market is in surplus or in deficit. And if you take the total oil inventories, um, they tell you that you're at quite a substantial deficit. And they tell you also that prices should be probably about $120 a barrel. But sure enough, you know, we're sitting here at 70, a massive, you know, 45 bucks off of the quote unquote fair price based on where the inventories are. And and the question that I think most people have to ask is why is that discrepancy around? And and I think that the answer to that, which is really strange in my mind, is that the market is considering these releases from the SPR as though they're a source of supply. And what I mean by that is if you look at the relationship between crude oil prices and commercial inventories, then all of a sudden the trend is held really, really well. So the market seems to be taking its cues from commercial inventories and not total inventories, which to me is a really strange way of doing it. Um, because if you think about it, when the government decides to release oil out of the SPR, if what you're really trying to look at inventories are as a proxy for whether the market's balanced or not, well, if all of a sudden the government releases oil from the SPR and that goes into the commercial system, does that mean the market is now in massive surplus? I would say, no, not really. You're just reclassifying government stockpiles into commercial stockpiles. But the market seems to be treating it as though it's almost like a giant new oil well that came online gushing a million barrels a day um, like it has for the last you know 18 months. So I think that that's a really, really strange occurrence. Uh, there's some precedent for it. You know, back in the early 2000s, we actually added oil to the SPR, you know, right as the U.S. was invading Iraq. There was concerns over security of supply. So the U.S. actually added oil into its strategic reserves. And during that period of time, the market actually kind of treated that as a new source of demand. Um, so I guess this is the flip side of that coin. But whether they treat it as supply or whether they treat it as just renaming inventories, the SPR is now about 50% below its peak. And there's pretty wide agreement that, that particularly once we have the debt ceiling um, lifted now, that the SPR releases will probably come to an end. So I think that that's another thing that's been, um, that's been hurting the oil markets recently. I think it's a little bit short-sighted and foolish. I don't know that it really reflects any change in the fundamentals. Uh, but, you know, markets don't always reflect um, short term, uh, you know, truth. So there you go. And hedge fund manager, I think our mutual friend, hedge fund manager, Cuppy Harris Copperman also laid out the case a couple of weeks ago that a ton of extra paper, paper oil futures contracts, about $6 billion per day was uh, being created and going net short. So uh, I mean, eventually those will be have to be covered. Oil is a physical market. The inventories will decline. I mean, I think the in the short term, uh, the rig count is going to keep falling. So I think we're going to start seeing supply side problems soon, especially with a lot of the cheaper oil is uh, a lot of the cheaper oil production is just not there. So we're we're at much higher cost oil than 10, 15, 20 years ago. Oh, I think that's uh, I think that's absolutely correct. And and you know, as I alluded to before. Really, everything has stopped growing except the shales. So if you look 
Right. So all, all the other growth in the world has has stopped. Um, the shales have really represented 100% of non-OPEC growth and now actually 100% of total oil demand or oil supply growth over the last, you know, between eight and 15 years, depending on whether you want to look at non-OPEC or total global supply. Um, and within the shales, you've actually stopped growing most of them as well. So you stopped growing the Bakken and you stopped growing the Eagleford, and both of those are still 25% below their pre-COVID levels. The only basin that's shown any growth in the last four years in the world has really been the Permian Basin in West Texas. Now, that's astonishing. You know, we've never had global oil demand growth resting on so, so narrow shoulders as we do today. You basically have six counties in West Texas providing all of the growth in the world. And that's um, awfully, awfully dangerous, particularly if you start to have problems in the Permian. So with that as a background, you know, we set out trying to look and understand about how productive the Permian was and what it might actually roll over. And, and we shouldn't underestimate how important the shales have been to the world and how important the Permian has been. <clears throat> if you look at total shale oil production in the US, it's basically as as consequential as Saudi Arabia. And it came online in a 10-year period, right? The Saudi major fields took 20 to 30 years to really ramp up and develop. Th this all came on in a 10-year period. And not only was it the shale oil fields, but the shale gas fields basically brought on the equivalent of another Saudi Arabia as well. So it's been pretty monumental in the in the um, world energy markets. But as I've been telling people uh, recently, big is not the same as infinite. And I think at the beginning part of the development of these shales, they seemed so big that they could almost grow forever. And indeed, in 2015 and 2016, that really seemed to be the case because oil prices fell. The U.S. stopped drilling wells. They stopped drilling like their recount fell 80 percent or our recount fell 80 percent. And yet production, uh, as soon as prices stabilized and, and drilling picked up even a little bit, production came right back. So it seemed as though you could almost bring on any amount of production you want with, with almost no rigs. It was really quite a remarkable thing. And there's this prevailing view that the shales were almost um, without end and, and, and almost sort of magical in their nature. But, but big is not the same as infinite. And we've now reached peak production in two of the three major shale basins. And I think that we're very close to hitting peak production in the Permian as well. So we first did this big model and this big study back in 2019, where we looked at how much of these different basins had been drilled and how much of their good tier one acres remain. And we came to the conclusion that the Eagleford and the Bakken were pretty much mostly drilled up in their best areas and probably wouldn't be able to grow going forward. And that was a really good call. And in the Permian, we said probably 2026, 2027, somewhere in the back, back half of the decade, you would peak production in the Permian. And that the incremental growth from 2018 to 2026, 27 would be much, much lower per year than it had been. But now I think looking back on that call, it was actually way too conservative because we're starting to see major productivity degrade uh, degradation in the Permian already. And so last year in 2022, the average Permian well brought on 9% less oil than, the, than in 2021. And in 2023, we're seeing those trends continue. And when we start to run them through our models to understand what's driving them, it's really geology. It's the idea that you've drilled out your best areas, and now you're being forced into lower quality drilling locations. That's the first time that's ever happened in the Permian. The Permian has always seen productivity get better and better and better. And this is the first time we've seen it go in reverse. And in the Eagleford and Bakken, that was a clear indicator that you were about to peak production and have it roll over. So I worry that that's going to happen in the Permian too. Yeah, I think the Permian was a victim of its own success with those octopus drilling pads because they just became faster and more efficient at the horizontal wells and the hydraulic fracturing. And they were just what putting um, all these wells together and just pulling the oil out of the ground faster and faster and faster. Well, eventually there's a limit and it looks like we've either hit the limit or very close to hitting the limit. I agree. And, uh, and, and, that's a really, really important day in the world oil markets because all that concern about running out of oil from 15 years ago, which has sort of seemed silly since the shales have come surging on, 
all of that's going to come back to the fore awfully quickly when you stop having the shales uh, as this persistent source of growth. Um, I, I really people I don't understand just how important the developments in the energy market have been in the last 10 years. If you ask most people what they think about shale, half of them might not even know what you're talking about. And the other half will say that they were value destructors. Uh, whereas the truth is that it's probably the most important single decade in the history of the hydrocarbon energy business um, in the last you know 150 years. And, and, and we're at risk of now seeing that come to an end. And uh, we, the U.S. American consumers, American businesses, they were gifted with cheaper natural gas, cheaper yeah. oil compared to a lot of other countries. But now I think those days are coming to an end in the not too distant future. Do you think we're headed back towards similar to 2007, where almost all the future oil production growth is going to have to come from these deep water offshore wells that are a lot more expensive? Yeah, I do think so. I'm, I mean, you know, one of the questions we get asked a lot <clears throat> is where do we see new production coming from to backfill some of this you know even if it means higher prices even if it means whatever you know where will it come from and and look you know the resource markets and the oil markets they're cyclical and they move up based on a capital cycle and so we need to get money back in and we need to spend it in various areas and at some point the cycle will be over just like it is with every cycle and production will be coming online probably at exactly the wrong time when it's not needed and prices will fall. That's a long way away. And I don't know where that production is going to come from. You know, it becomes difficult to look forward and, and, and make that prediction. For instance, if you were looking in 2009 um, and you were talking about all of this issues with peak oil and all of the idea of, you know, running out of, of oil and the rise of China, and how are you ever going to meet that demand? Shale was on the horizon. And indeed, we were really early investors in the shale industry. But nobody, including ourselves, thought that shale would be able to ramp to you know 10 million barrels a day and, and, and become as significant to the world market as Saudi Arabia. So is there something else out there like it? I can't see what it would be. But you, know, you probably should never discount human ingenuity. So we actually have about 10% of the fund in, in deep water offshore. That would be my kind of you know go-to prediction as to where you might see growth uh, over the next few years but we're also on the lookout for for you know any other sources of growth as well now i've heard your partner the other managing partner at your commodities fund talk about other potential shale plays in other countries whether it's russia china argentina i think argentina is pro projecting doubling their oil production out of their shale place but that's only a i think five hundred thousand barrel per day increase over the next five years give or take are there other shell plays in other countries that have a similar potential to the Permian Basin? Well, to the Permian, no, that maybe one, and that would be the Russian, the Berezov shell, which underlies all of the um, Eastern Siberia polar Arctic gas fields and things like that. Um, there's obviously a huge impediment to, to shale production in Russia as it stands now. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. And in the last, you know, 10 years or so, there's actually been a special set of sanctions against allowing shale technology into Russia. So for all the talk of, you know, any type of a uh, of an easing in, in sentiment, obviously not now with, with what's happening in the Ukraine, but a few years ago when things looked like they might be making progress on sanctions and what have you, the sh so-called shale sanctions were never on the table. Th those always, always remain. So I don't see that changing. Uh, and so I think until enough history and time goes by, the likelihood that Russia is able to develop its shale asset is zero. Um, after that, you know, we did a big study probably almost 15 years ago, where we <clears throat> looked at all of the geological features that make a good shale basin. And we asked everyone in the industry, and we tried to construct an index, you know, if you had the perfect a uh, shopping list of, of things you would want in a shale. What would it be? Thickness, thermal maturity, organic content, um, low clay, high silica, the right temperature, the right pressure, things like that. And with that, we went out and we ranked all the world shale basins. It turns out that you can get a lot of the data. Um, the uh, EIA, the US Energy Information Agency, actually puts out a lot of data in world shale basins. And what we noticed was that seven of the 10 top shales based on those criteria that the industry was telling us were important, were all in the US. 
And it sort of seems unbelievable, but you know, resource endowments are not normally distributed all over the world. There's areas that have incredible resource endowments and others that don't. You know, you look at South Africa with its gold deposits and its platinum deposits, Russia with palladium, Canada with uranium, what have you. You tend to have areas where you get really high concentration of the best quality asset. And it seems, for whatever reason, that the United States has the best of the world's shales. Now, that becomes a little bit of a difficult thesis to test, right? You make that prediction, and basically the prediction we made was that you weren't going to have wide-scale shale development outside of the U.S. And day one goes by, and there's no development. So you say, well, I guess we're right. And day two goes by. So now we're on 10 years, and we haven't seen any material development in the shales outside of the United States. And I think with every passing day, it gives credence that our models are probably right. But, you know, you never know. Uh, obviously, conventional oil production started basically simultaneously in the United States and in Azerbaijan in the late 19th century and uh, eventually spread to the rest of the world. So it's possible um, that you could see that again with the shales. But looking at the geological um, underpinnings of what makes a good shale, I think, unfortunately, for the rest of the world, most of those good shales are in the United States. And I know there's a matching geological formation right across the border in Mexico with the Eagle Ford, but I don't think that's going to be heavily drilled anytime soon, unfortunately. Well, the other thing that's funny about that is that um, you start to abut uh, various more seismically active areas and more mountainous regions. And that's a really important distinction with shale basins as well. Because if you think about a shale basin, there's no permeability and porosity. There, there's permeability, but there's not there's porosity, but no permeability. So you have to frack the well, put all this energy down hole in order to rubbleize everything and <clears throat> make all this artificial permeability to help flow the oil and the gas. Now, the problem with a, a seismically active area is you get faults and you get big natural fault zones. So when you go to put the energy down, none of the energy actually goes into the reservoir. It, it takes the path of least resistance and it goes into the natural fractures and the natural faulting in the area. So you haven't had a lot of success at being able to <clears throat> produce commercially in seismically active areas. And when you chase the Eagle Ford into, the Mex into Mexico, it's not long before you do kind of a butt a more seismically active area. So even if they do develop it and if they get the equipment down there and they get the technique and the expertise, I don't think it's going to be nearly as big as the Eagleford was because it's not as aerially extensive until you begin to hit into that seismically active fault zones. We saw that also like in, in the UK with the Gatwick gusher and there's been regulatory issues with developing shale deposits in the UK as well. But one of the issues that we identified with the Gatwick gusher, which was a good initial test well, <clears throat> was that it was in an area that was pretty broken up. And so you would potentially drill a well, then drill another one, one pad over and and, and just not almost get no commercial production at all. And that's what we've been hearing has actually been the case. And so, yes, there's some regulatory issues there as well. But I think more than anything, there's there's a geological issue with the, with the Gatwick shales. Um which we would predict given given the seismic activity there. I should point out that the other um, good shale potential uh, is the one um, that you mentioned down in Argentina. Uh, and so, you know, if Argentina can get their kind of act together, then I, you know, would, would be keen to look at that. Uh, it's a ways away though. And I think they're, former president uh, five, six, seven years ago, I think she nationalized a lot of their oil assets. So I don't know how, mu how much of the oil assets are privately owned or not. I know I know the mining companies, if you're a foreign private mining company, you can go and buy assets there and invest. And as of now, you're not going to have to worry about confiscation, but I think it's different for the oil assets in Argentina. Oh yeah, no, it, it, it's all very, very tricky. And, um, and um, it, it's also, you know, a, a huge issue with getting capital out of the region. So even those mining companies, 
Um, once they generate profits, sometimes have a difficult time getting cash out of Argentina. So Argentina is a, a mess, um, but I'm just talking strictly geology. In your opinion, is energy the cheapest in the entire commodities complex right now in terms of profit margins, free cash flow, maybe dividend yields? I would have to say so. I mean, <clears throat> you know, when you look at um, how cheap some of these companies have really become, and of course, it all depends on what you use for um, your oil price and your gas price. But if you just take the strip and you use that as a base case, which I think, you know, oil and gas prices will be much above that, <clears throat> then these names are extremely, extremely cheap. You know, many of them are trading at low single digit multiples and t- upwards of 20% yields. Yeah, I mean, Petrobras has a really high dividend yield and they have some amazing deep water offshore wells, but there's a lot of Canadian and US energy companies right now with seven to 10% dividend yields. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, yeah. Petrobras is always one that 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 comes up. There's some you know risk and hair on it, as they say. But you know, you look at you look at uh, Pioneer, you know, which is a holding of ours, and there's been some chatter that you know Exxon is is, is talking about acquiring them. I have absolutely no idea whether that's rumor or not, but it's been widely published. But you know, it has a indicated gross yield as of today of like seven percent, um, and if you get you know. It's trading on six, seven times earnings. And if you were to get, um, even at these prices, but if you were to get higher prices, then I mean, the value of the stock is is probably two to three X where, where it is right now. Uh, and, and that, you know, is about as conservative a company as you get, uh, very well run, totally top tier drilling areas in the Permian. Um, so kind, kind of, you know, you don't have to go so far afield these days to find really attractive valuations. What's also surprising is that traditional value investors like David Einhorn and normally a traditional value investor <clears throat> won't won't buy a cyclical business, a commodities producer that has lots of maintenance capex. And and if you look at his holdings, his filings on the 13 Fs, he's been adding coal stocks. He's been adding natural gas stocks and oil stocks. Yeah, well, you know. Look at look at uh, Warren Buffett's biggest positions are now all oil companies as well. Look, I think when it comes down to it, when you look back a decade from now, we're going to say, what was this all about? And it was really all, it'll have been about shortages. <coughs> Excuse me. And the reason that I think it'll have been about shortages is because <clears throat> we just underspent for so long and we neglected the upstream part of basically our entire economy for the better part of a decade or even 15 years, depending on what commodity market you look at. And that can work for a while, but it eventually will come home to roost. And I think it's starting to now, and I think it'll get worse from here. And, you know, people have asked us, how could we go, let this go for so long? And I think part of it's obviously ESG uh, in the sense that there's been a view in the last six or seven years that we don't need to invest in oil and gas because wind and solar will bail us out of all this. And we can talk about <clears throat> some of the reasons why I don't think that'll be the case at all. Um, it has to do with the energy density and the physics of the oil uh, of, of oil and gas compared to wind and solar, where basically <clears throat> the density of renewables are so low that you have to make these projects so huge that the materials that go into them are in and of themselves extremely energy intensive. And so our, be- our battery technology sucks too. To add to your points, our battery technology sucks. And in our electrical grid, can we even move the power from one state to another, even from one county? I mean, California is having problems transmitting the power and moving it. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And and so, you know, in my mind anyway, you're, you're, you're left <clears throat> with traditional forms of energy. Uh, I hope that we can get our act together and move towards nuclear power because ultimately we're very bullish on uranium and nuclear power and think that that is the answer to ultra high efficiency, low carbon base load power going forward generates no CO2. And it's three times more efficient and effective on an energy return on investment basis than oil and gas and probably 10 to 20 times more efficient than wind and solar. So it would solve all of our problems, but we refuse to kind of acknowledge that. <clears throat> but in the meantime, you know, you, you've you diverted all this capital from traditional sources of energy towards renewables. And you had such an abundance of cheap, reliable baseload power, basically because of the shales, 
that you were able to do that in year one and you were able to do it in year two, but every year it ratcheted a little bit tighter and a little bit tighter. And I think that now 2022 was the shot across the bow in terms of how fragile our energy infrastructure is. And, you know, obviously Russia's invasion of the Ukraine was uh, an important, hugely important geopolitical event, you know, but from an energy market perspective, it didn't disrupt flows all that much. And, and, all of a sudden, you know, the idea of resource scarcity and the idea of <clears throat> abundance became completely put on its head. And so I think that that was really the the shot across the bow and that now going forward, we're going to have to finally deal with the fact that we haven't invested in this space for 15 years and and it's starting to have a major impact on on, on production at the same time as demand remains very, very strong. Yeah, I see supply side uh, problems across the board for most commodities now, whether it's copper. I mean, you have all these politicians, whether it's the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, announcing by 2030 he doesn't want to sell any more internal combustion engine cars in California. He doesn't want them driving on his roads, but there's not enough copper, not enough <laughs> lithium, not enough rare earth elements, and not enough nickel or cobalt or these other key elements to make enough electric vehicles. So I, I don't know if the politicians are either stupid or lazy. They're not figuring out that there's not enough of these other supply uh, uh, key metals to make the electric vehicles for their plans for ESG. No, I think that's exactly right. You know, I, I, the only one that I might push back on a little bit is lithium. We've seen a huge lithium capex boom, and if people ask me, well, is there anything in commodities that hasn't had this huge capital cycle and the starvation of spending? I'd say lithium. You know, lith we spent a lot of money on lithium in the last couple of years, and it's not fundamentally a supply constrained element in the same way that copper is. But yeah, I mean, if you look at <clears throat> a lot of the different metals and minerals, um, whether it's copper, nickel, cobalt, you know, nickel depends on who you ask might be in a slight surplus right now, but we haven't really spent too much on any of these industries. Um, but there's really nothing that comes close from a capital privation perspective <laughs> to oil, gas, and coal. And uh, you know, coal over the long term. You can debate its use uh, in the sense that, <clears throat> you know, I think we should all be switching from coal to natural gas. It's just as efficient as coal and it has half the CO2. So to me, that's a no brainer. Uh, but, you know, tell that to a European last summer when they were trying to get ready for winter that, oh, you know, you don't have to worry about any of this stuff because gas is the answer. And they would say, well, I think, you know, you're missing the forest for the trees here. We haven't spent enough on gas and now we're quite short of it all. So, you know, I think that coal will be with us for a while too. And talk about an industry that's been starved for capital. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, Chile just announced recently that they're going to nationalize their lithium mines. Do you expect more policy measures like this with resource nationalization for maybe key energy elements? It seems that way. You know, it's always difficult to predict black swan geopolitical events, but um, it, it seems as though the pendulum is certainly swinging in the direction of resource nationalism. And uh, I would expect that to continue. So I think the answer is definitely yes. I mean, normally what these governments do, Adam, and I know you've been in the commodities markets a long time, normally they just want to renegotiate the royalty tax. So you have like Panama, Chile, Peru, when the copper price spiked, I think, what, 18 months ago to $5 a pound, they wanted to renegotiate the royalty tax for copper miners. Well, as soon as that came out publicly, you had all the copper miners that invested in Chile saying, uh, we're going to cut CapEx. And now the copper supply, even though the copper price is down, you have the charts there showing the uh, uh, annual supply of copper in Chile, it's trending downwards anyway. Yeah, well, look, you know, there's, there's always going to be a, a bit of an interesting dynamic between the host countries and the commodity producers all around the world because <clears throat> resource extraction is a very commodity intensive business. And that money comes from, you know, people like us uh, and, and obviously a lot others much bigger than us who invest in the resource space and, and, Pretty much everybody um, runs their universe of names through a geopolitical risk lens and says, well, do I really want to be operating or, or own companies that operate in Indonesia or in Chile or in Peru or what have you? So <clears throat> there's a codependent relationship between the capital markets, the producers, and and the host countries. You know, if if, if the host countries take too much, 
then uh, capital dries up and, and you can't build new projects or maintain the ones that you have. And on the flip side, if you put that money into the ground in a, in a certain country, it's there and you can't take that asset with you and leave. So, you know, you're, you're, you are quite vulnerable um, and, and the countries know that. And so th- th- that, that interplay is always uh, at work. Um, I do think that around the world, including in the United States, the feeling of resource nationalism is much greater than it has been in the past. You know, there's talks about strategic stockpiling uh, in this country, not of oil, presumably, since we're depleting that strategic reserve, but of other things. <laughs> like and, earth. Yeah, I know. I know there's politicians trying to bring up they want a rare earth stockpile. Yeah, there's rare earth stockpiles there. Um, you know, there, there's been a huge amount of concern around our ability or our reliance on foreign sourced uranium for our nuclear fleets and obviously for our um, n- nuclear naval uh power as well. So yeah, I, I think the idea of resource nationalism is becoming more real. Um, and, and I think we're kind of, for the time being anyway, going back to a little balkanization of the world where we have these sort of trading blocks. You know, if you're if you're trading Russian crude into China or India, that's a very different market than if you're trading <clears throat> light sweet crude from the Gulf Coast coming from the Permian into you know, refineries in Europe or what have you. So, so I, I do think things are getting more complicated and, and less efficient. Do you think that we've hit peak gold for gold mining? Yeah, that's an interesting question. A lot of people have, have talked about that for, for a long time. And, and, you know, we certainly have not come across any rush of new major high grade gold deposits. Um, so that, that that's entirely possible. The gold mining business is awfully difficult. We, you know, we have a lot of gold mining investments we've been adding in the last six or eight months. And and ultimately, I think that if <clears throat> gold prices move higher and you get a gold bull market, a lot of the names will do well. And I think we're pretty good at identifying projects that have good upside potential and that are maybe underappreciated by the market. But having said all that, yeah, it's hard to be a gold miner because there's not a lot of gold mines out there. So um Depletion is at work across the board in the gold space. What you are going after is becoming more challenging. There's not a clear source of like technology that's going to unlock a new wave of new deposits or anything like that. So I think it's possible. Uh, I think it's possible. Yeah, I think a common theme for a lot of the miners is right now, especially with higher interest rates from the Fed, unless you're a low cost producer, it's cost of capital. You're dealing with maintenance CapEx bills that a lot of miners are announcing these uh, capital spending programs. Some of them delay their CapEx budgets for years. Now they have very large CapEx bills on for maintenance CapEx. And then uh, the cost for the miners, because a lot of it's because of the grade. So you have higher energy costs, of the trend, still trending higher, higher labor costs in emerging markets, and then falling grades. If you look at the grade, especially for silver miners, I looked at the average grades for Penmark and silver from 2000, I think, 13. And they've been cut in half now for the average grades that they're silver mine now, and it's not even a decade. So, I mean, the industry, whether it's copper, gold, silver, the grades are just trending downward. We're really scraping the bottom of the barrel for key metals like copper and silver. No, I think that that's right. <clears throat> and, you know, actually my my partner Lee was one of the first people to identify head grade declines and first in copper mines in the early 2000s and then in gold mines as well uh, and, and, and various precious metal mines. Uh, so that's something that we've been doing, looking at for a long, long, long time and and something that I think the market is, is waking up to uh, at this point. But um, no, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and And one thing that I would say though about you know, companies that that are now facing higher interest rates and cost appreciation and things of that nature. And you said, you know, you have to be the lowest quartile or the lowest cost producer and all this type of stuff. You know, I'll tell you sort of a, a humorous observation. <laughs> I've been going to mining conferences for, you know, 17 years. And there's still names today that were there back in 2007 when gold was seven hundred dollars an ounce and you know they were out there saying at the time well if gold only gets to 900 bucks then we're really in the money and we're going to just do very very well and of course those projects aren't in production yet and haven't been able to raise financing and and the reason is because you know that that elusive hundred dollars on the gold price 
is really more of a sign of where you rank in the global uh, mind pecking order, if you will. And good projects have a tendency to get better and bad projects have a tendency to get worse. And I think that's what you're seeing with a lot of those names. Um, and so, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that um, it doesn't surprise me that a number of companies out there are complaining about higher cost pressures and stuff like that. Now, you know, the good, high quality, high grade room for expansion gold mines will see higher prices too, but it'll be amazing that they'll just somehow be able to manage, whereas the other guys will just constantly get squeezed and uh, and be in quite a bit of trouble. Do you think we're going to see a long-term gold bull market, or do you think that uh, the gold price is going to sell off here as the Fed uh, debates whether or not to raise interest rates more? Oh, I think we're setting up for, for a very, I mean, both of those things could be true. I think we're setting up for a very strong bull market. And we like to look at the value of gold and precious metals, uh, above ground gold supply to the stock of financial assets. And it was a variation on that theme that <clears throat> Lee used in 1999 to predict the bottom of the gold market. And he was dead right. And gold obviously went from 275 to 2000. It was the best performing asset of the next 20 years. He was featured in Forbes writing that in the summer of 99. People thought he was crazy. If you do that today, you're above $10,000 an ounce in gold for sure. So we're not gold bugs. you know. I don't think that gold's like the solution to everyone's problems all the time. But I do think that... If you look at it objectively from a valuation perspective, there's a very clear case to be made for much higher gold. Now, I do think that you're seeing um, a lot of headwinds in the form of a rate height cycle. So if you get you know, two more or however many more, uh, is it possible that gold uh, has trouble breaking out of that what's now been a triple top? Yeah, it's, that's totally possible. Um, but that doesn't concern me too much because I think, it, again, at the end of this decade, we're going to look back <clears throat> and say, if if we do have a bull market in, in resources, there's really never been a bull market in resources that hasn't had a gold component to it. Now, the, the question's usually been on timing, and we've kind of timed this one fairly well so far, which is unusual for us. We're not the best market timers, but you know, we got out of the gold market right when it kind of made its peak in the summer of 2020. We got back in, in late 2022. Um, Although we bought a little bit in early 2022, which was a touch early. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it's out there in front of us, whether or not you have to make it through one or two more rate heights, it's, it's entirely possible. You know, pe people like to complain about how bad gold did, but, you know, considering we've had the sharpest <clears throat> um, rate hike cycle in, in history in 2020, and you retested the, the highs, you know, in March of 2023, I'm sorry, in 2022, you had the rate hikes and then you retested the highs in 2023. I think gold's holding in pretty pretty well. Um, now, here's something else that's kind of interesting to think about. If you look at the price of resources relative to the price of financial assets, and in our case, we like to use the Dow, then there's never been a period where commodities are as cheap as they are today. Historically, every major period of commodity cheapness relative to financial assets has been resolved in, by commodities moving much higher. You know, 29 to 38 was a good example, 69 to 80, 99 to 20, 10. And then we think today, the trigger that re-rated commodity prices from radically undervalued to ultimately radically overvalued was a shift in the global monetary order so in 29, we left the gold exchange standard. In 68, we left the Bretton Woods standard. In 99, we pegged all the Asian currencies on a devalued basis to the dollar to help spur their exports. That was the thing to look for to re-rate <clears throat> commodities and start a new bull market. And as you shifted that global monetary order, I think that's where you built up all this pressure in the gold market and was ultimately relieved by these big, big, big moves higher in gold. And I look to the sort of de-dollarization theme that people are talking about now as an example of what might be the the catalyst for this new cycle too. And lots of people have talked for a long time about this de-dollarization, this idea that the U.S. would lose its reserve currency status, um, and that you know the deficits that we're running are too high, and the acrimony in the political discourse is too great. And the weaponization of the SWIFT banking system has been too aggressive. All these types of things. People have been talking about it for 10 years. But there's never been any sign that anybody was really keen 
to stop using the dollar as a reserve currency. You know, there's talk to say, well, why would China want this? I, I got, I get it, but they still use dollars to settle their trades. They still accumulated treasuries. They, you know, they were in. They were, they were fully bought in. I don't think you can really say that anymore. You know, you look at Saudi agreeing to sell crude to China in renminbi, Total agreeing to sell LNG in renminbi, um, Brazil looking to sell everything they can to China also in renminbi. So you know, all of the writing has been on the wall, the idea of weaponizing the dollar, the idea of, you know, deficit, persistent deficits, uh, exploding deficits, and political discord. But now it seems to be that people are waking up and doing something about it. So could we see a shift in the global monetary system? I don't think that we're going to see a you know collapse in the US dollar. But even a shift on the margin uh, would be historically coincident with a massive re-rating in gold and a massive re-rating in commodities relative to financial assets. So it seems as though the, the different pieces are starting to fall into place. Well, since the U.S. government uh, put the foreign policy sanctions on Russia and confiscated <clears throat> about $300 billion of their assets, which were in U.S. treasuries, I think a lot of these non-G7 central banks and those governments that are running trade surpluses have decided that they're not going to buy treasuries because if they do something the U.S. government doesn't like, their tre- doesn't like, their treasuries can be confiscated. So you've started to see, and that coincided with basically the bottom in gold in mid to late 2022, and you started to see these numbers come out from non-G7 central banks that there were big net purchases of gold tonnage. So I think that trend will continue going forward. Yeah, absolutely. You you have it spot on. You know, the central banks became a massive, massive gold buyer in the fourth quarter that spilled over into the first quarter. And um, I think whatever is going to replace the US dollar as a reserve currency or as a monetary system, if indeed we go down that path, which I think is looking more likely that we will, uh, we'll, we'll probably have a gold component to it, you know, because one of the pushbacks that people say is, well, look, you know, what's going to replace the dollar? Um, it's the best house on a bad block or whatever. And <clears throat> I do get that, you know, the renminbi can't be the global reserve currency. It doesn't even have an open capital market. Um, <laughs> there's talk of <clears throat> recycling renminbi surpluses into CGBs or Chinese government bonds. That doesn't really fix your problem. That just kind of kicks the can down the road, right? Because you'll get renminbi back when those mature. I guess you could keep rolling them forever, but you don't really address your problem. So what the Chinese would love for you to do would be to buy Chinese goods and recycle them that way. Uh, Or there needs to be some gold convertibility. The more I've thought about it, the more I really do think that that's sort of the way that you're going to, at least on the margin, settle some of these surpluses and deficits. So I, I don't think, you know, I don't think we're, on the road back to a hard gold standard on an international basis, but could you see some convertibility of various currencies to be able to manage and offset, uh, repatriate surpluses and deficits? I think that's entirely possible. And I think it's actually quite likely. So, you know, if that were to happen, I mean, my goodness, I mean, first of all, you need gold to be multiples higher just to get enough dollar liquidity in that market to be able to do that. But secondly, I mean, that would just start an unbelievable bull market for real assets. And I think in mainland China, private sector Chinese gold demand, that trend will also continue because they have problems with their, there's rumors of a currency devaluation. They have problems with their real estate market, their housing bubble is going bust. So um, the average Chinese person there who's not super wealthy has limited investment options for getting, for diversifying or getting protecting themselves from inflation or currency devaluation. So physical gold, gold coins, gold bars, gold jewelry is one of the main options for someone in mainland China. Sure. And and to say nothing of, you know, the speculative side of it, you know, nobody is speculating on gold right now. Um, You know, no one has any interest. You know, we had one tiny whiff of, of animal spirits and speculation in the precious metal markets. And that's when the Reddit crowd tried to corner the silver market and immediately was was vanquished which which is makes sense you can't nonsense you know the idea that jp morgan is secretly controlling the silver market is not something that i believe um although i'm sure some people will will write me angry letters if i say that um but you know what's going to happen to some of these markets when you start 
to not only like what you said with with you know the Chinese seeing mainland China seeing increased demand because the currency is going to collapse and the housing sector is going to implode. That's one thing. But what happens when you know a billion Chinese decide that they want to speculate on the price of gold because it's going up every day? You know these markets just can't handle it. They're they're small. You know. In the 1970s, there were months on end in which corn would be limited up for the day, just couldn't transact because they can get overwhelmed with capital uh, if they become uh, in favor. So we're a long way away from that. But but I, I, I unfortunately believe that this is going to just take on completely, completely um, ridiculous proportions uh, as 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 the speculative animal spirits come back in people are still unbelievably bearish on the space unbelievably bearish you know last year <clears throat> the enp average enp stock was up you know, 60% the market was down teens and what do you think the flows into the enp etfs were i mean they were negative the whole year everyone sold it they sold it all year um, so you know, there's absolutely this is this market's been fighting a wall of worry and has been just working against incredibly negative sentiment. But um, at some point, it's going to turn and, and people are going to be wildly bullish, and, and and probably most of the move will be gone at that point. But you know, that that's how markets work, I guess. There's incredibly bearish sentiment now for commodities, especially energy. I mean, I I talk about price to earnings ratios or cash flow multiples or dividend yield that people can get on energy stocks. And the average investor who doesn't research commodities like you and me doesn't want to hear it. They're like, oh, the five or six big cap tech stocks are rallying and I want to get in on that. Uh, I want to go buy Bitcoin. So the, no one wants to hear that you can uh, be a contrarian and you can go and buy quality companies at discounted prices in energy or commodities right now. Uh, those things are just hated. That's the general sentiment i would say i as somebody who works in that industry i would tend to agree with you well i, I was just over the weekend uh for memorial day here in the u.s i was talking with regular investors you know people who don't um uh, inflation is dead the feds destroy the feds killing inflation with the interest rate hikes there's deflation and bankruptcies they don't want to hear anything good about uh, uh energy or commodities right now well you know it's like the old adage that Markets tend to operate in fear and greed, and and certainly uh, fear is the prevalent feeling in the real asset space. And all you have to do is look at that chart. We put it up a bunch where where it looks at commodity prices relative to financial assets. They remain as cheap as they've ever been. You know, energy in the S and P five hundred is you know four point five percent. The long term average is like fourteen percent. Yes, it got it got lower in, in in the midst of COVID. It was two percent, but it's it's not much up off of that. Um, and and you know back in 2010 it was like 20 percent bull markets end with energy at 30 percent of the index it's four percent today give or take so this is a long <clears throat> way to go people are still incredibly bearish um one of the things that i do think is a little bit different and then i do have to run here but one of the things that i think is a little bit different this cycle is you know it's been so bad for so long that you really dismantled the whole generation of institutional knowledge in the industry and in the in the space and so most firms don't have an energy analyst, which is shocking to me. I've never, you know, could imagine that that would be the case. But I was speaking, I forget where, I was speaking to somebody <clears throat> and they just brought in a new head of the energy desk. And I said, oh, where did they come from? And they said, consumer retail. And I mean, I just, you know, okay. And, and, and I'm sure, you know, they'll they'll learn the ropes. But I mean, things are very different this time because you've taken out an entire generation of institutional knowledge in the space. And what does that mean? You know, well, I think one of the things that it means is that, uh, you know, in, in cycles past, you would have an energy analyst who would go through the lean times. And if he avoided getting fired, he would or she would just sit there and kind of keep their head down. And then the fundamentals would turn better. And it was like, you know, put me in the game, coach. My time's come. You know, this is my time. And, and would have all the data ready to go. And they would be so bullish maybe prematurely and maybe, you know, incorrectly, but you had someone advocating for the industry in some of these larger firms. Now you don't, that role has been merged with um, industrials or cyclicals or something else. So instead of this like energy analyst, who's been doing nothing for the last six years, who's been desperate, 10 years, who's desperate to get back in the game. You now have somebody who has actually been taking you away from energy into other industrials or cyclicals based on their mandate or purview. And, and, they're desperate that this rally is actually short-lived. 
And so, I mean, I, I joked that I could hear the collective relief gasp last year in the summer when energy finally <clears throat> stopped going up because it meant that all these people said, oh, thank God, I actually don't have to buy it right now. I can just kick this can down the road and make a decision about it later. Um, because it was, you were very close to to reaching, a, I think, a bearish capitulation there where, where you know, after 2021, where <clears throat> energy stocks did very well, but the rest of the market was up. In 2022, energy stocks did very well and the rest of the market was down. You know, I think a lot of people started um, look, being forced to say, well, look, we're going to have to make an allocation here. And then, and then the recent sell-off has kind of postponed that. Yeah, I agree. And now a lot of those firms that you mentioned are hiring ESG people. Uh, the colleges are not graduating petrol uh, regular mining geologists or petroleum geologists. A lot of people are graduating with environmental science and ESG type degrees. So those are the the types of people that are getting hired in financial firms or large corporations are bringing in more ESG people. And then when the oil prices were high, instead of the politicians saying we need to make investments into new supply, the politicians were like, we need windfall profits taxes, we need drilling bans, we need to get these companies to stop consuming gasoline and other petroleum products. Strange world. Well, I see future supply problems um, in the short term. Uh, I think there's global macro issues, but in the long term, I think we're going to be proven correct with uh, additional supply problems, especially in the energy side. Oh, I, I think so too. Look, you know, I, th I think that <clears throat> the resources world is always a cyclical business. It's always, always, always a cyclical business. Too much money comes in, it chases projects, they get underwritten at high prices, prices collapse. Everyone thinks that the you know, oil industry is, is a bunch of wildcatting snake oil salesmen. And what did Mark Twain say about a gold miner is a liar standing on top of a hole um, and, and money pours back out. And, and, and this is a, just a really serious, serious cycle. Uh, very, very pronounced, very long and very deep. But, but probably that means that the <clears throat> flip side to it will be even more robust. Um, and as far uh you know as far as um volatility goes it is always a volatile space but i think people that can protect some of their wealth by allocating to the space uh, will be very very pleased uh several years from now and traditionally over longer cycles commodities are the best inflation hedge so if you go and look at past inflation cycles commodities have outperformed stocks bonds real estate in past inflationary cycles that is true. The 1970s are a poster child for the role of commodities in a portfolio. Adam, you are a wealth of information on commodities. If my listeners want to follow your work, your blog articles about commodities and newsletter, how do they do so? We post everything that we do online. All of our research papers were, you know, fairly <clears throat> prolific writers. We we write all the time, putting the finishing touches on our letter now should be out tomorrow. Um, you can go to our website, just type in Gehring and Rosen swag, um, or go Rosen is the website, G-O-R-O-Z-E-N. Uh, and, and everything is online. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. And hopefully you'll come back in the not too distant future for another update on the commodities markets. Thank you very much.